Hey everyone, thanks for joining this session. So what I wanna to share today is a really actionable and scalable program to help you get your retention program under uh, underway so that you can really start to attack and reduce your churn in 2020 and hit your goals in 2020 so you're not relying on new acquisition and getting new customers in the door. All right, so let's get into it. Um, this is called process-led retention the proactive approach to reduce churn and drive more recurring revenue. A little nod to the product-led growth uh, because I think that there are a lot of similarities here and I'd like to share that with you. So a little bit of background about me. My name is Gen Furukawa. I'm the founder at Retainable where we help B2B SaaS companies reduce churn. So 100% of my time is focused on this nagging problem that troubles lots of software as a service companies, and that is churn. Um, prior to starting Retainable, I was part of the founding team and led the marketing efforts at a high growth SaaS company called Jungle Scout, where we helped entrepreneurs launch and scale Amazon businesses. So I'm coming at churn from a marketing background, which I think makes sense as many of the principles are ultimately the same as a customer success uh, which is ultimately identifying what the customer needs are and then providing the solution to help them solve that need. Uh, a little bit about me, I, I also I have a family. We live in Austin, Texas. I was born and raised in New York and I love all things basketball, both playing, watching, reading about, and now I'm going to be coaching. Uh, that's my daughter there. She's a little bit older now and we or I am a big Steph Curry fan. So. This image really spoke to me. I, I really like this one from Guy Nearpaz, uh, founder and CEO of Totango, which is a customer success platform. And to me, this visually illustrates the fundamentals of what a sound SaaS business look like, because it's not about how many new customers you're getting or how fast your new customers sign up, but instead a majority of the revenues, what he's saying is 70 to 95% of revenues come from existing customers. So that's from the renewals and from the upsells. So it might seem that a majority of companies, there's a huge focus on new acquisition and growth from the top line in terms of user acquisition. Um, but I think ultimately the beauty of a SaaS business is generating recurring revenues, right? So if you can find product market fit and you can keep your customers happy, you essentially have the installed user base uh, that can become an annuity of revenue over time, month after month, year over year. So that's really where the beauty of retention comes, especially when you have the systems in place that are scalable over time, uh, is that you're able to uh, start with your user base and then keep them engaged and you no longer have to continue to pay more for customers. You've probably seen the stat that it's five to seven times more expensive to acquire a customer than uh, keep a customer and most of the revenues are going to come from your existing customer base. So that's what I really love about this. And it speaks to me from um, my experience at Jungle Scout where I was responsible for all the awareness and acquisition. Um, the, the challenge of growth becomes obviously far harder when there's a uh, the consistent customers that you, you acquire are going out the back door as well. So it's always harder to um, to get that traction to grow and continue to get net MRR growth um, if churn is a problem. So at Jungle Scout, for example, um, it was a whole team effort, but over the course of several months, several quarters, we ultimately prioritized churn and was very effective in reducing churn about 16%. Uh, this was across uh, you know, the, the leadership, product development, design, marketing, customer success. It, it was really an integrated full team effort, but it's the framework and the tactics that we use there that I'd like to share with you today. Um, and it's the, the tactics as well that I share and work with, uh, with the companies that I work with at Retainable. So um, a little bit goes a long way with improving churn. Um, let's just take a fictional B2B survey tool. Um, we'll call it Survey Chimp, very similar perhaps to uh, Survey Monkey. Uh, I've never worked with a survey tool, but I think that it has some interesting characteristics. And I have been a customer, so I know kind of like the dynamic of how it works. Um, 
in many ways, and this is my experience, uh, I was a customer who needed it and, and had a distinct need for it, and then didn't quite need it. So I'd, I'd churn out. So there's, I think, a large segment of customers who are kind of like the one and done, might come up again um, to be a reactivated customer, but they're, it, it's really incumbent on the software tool in order to instill the value and make customers understand like, hey, this is this is a really fantastic tool that solves a problem. Um, and that's really at the crux of improving uh, retention. Um, and also there are a wide variety of use cases, uh, both in why people would be sending out a survey and the type of role or organization that it's sent out on behalf of. So whether it's personal or professional, uh, the user base is very broad. Uh, and lastly, it's a very competitive market, I think. Uh, there are a lot of options uh, for survey tools, and even more so, there are free alternatives like, say, uh, Google Forms. So it presents a lot of interesting challenges in terms of what re revenue um, is as it relates to retention. So what I have on the right here is a little slide. Let's just assume that this company is doing $1 million uh, every month and that it's at 10% gross MRR. So that's not including any upsells or reactivations. It's just uh, the existing customer base churns out 10% MRR. Um, so that's the blue line there. And assuming just small incremental improvements. So if, if it was just five, 10, 20% of that 10%, you can see that the the improvement, uh, the the delta between the better churn and the baseline churn really starts to extend and get bigger as time goes on. And that's really the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is that there's, um, there's a compounding effect of uh, retaining customers. And that's really what happens when you're losing a, the same percentage of a smaller base over time or you're losing a smaller percentage of a bigger base over time. The, the efforts that you make with um, improving retention uh, take a little bit of time to, uh, to appear, but it is super important, especially when you take the long-term view of revenue over time. So uh, putting this together, I realized that I did bite off a lot in terms of what I, uh, what I can include in say a 30 minute presentation. So this might address things at a high level, but I did want to include uh, a few things and have you walk away with a few things. One is the strategy for how you would attack your customer churn. Uh, then the methodology uh, to sort through and prioritize the infinite initiatives uh, that are related to churn. And then lastly, a framework to put it all together so that you can incrementally improve your customer retention indefinitely. So in the end, I hope that this allows you to be more proactive in addressing churn so that you know, come the end of the month, you know that you are working towards addressing the root problem and not just looking at the churn number with your fingers crossed saying, I hope that it improved this month. So one caveat though with churn, it is one of the things that I love about it in terms of a problem to solve is that it is so multifaceted and it's also unique to every company. So the challenges that every company faces are unique. So that, that makes a little bit of a uh, conundrum when presenting it. So I'm going to speak at a high level, but also try and keep this tactical so that you are able to walk away and um, implement some of these things in your own company. I'll share my contact info at the end. And that way, at least please feel free to reach out. I love addressing these problems, helping uh, answer any questions that I didn't uh, get to here or any questions specific to your company, uh, definitely reach out to me. Uh, my email is gen, G-E-N, at retainable.com. All right, so here's the unsatisfying truth, and it kind of sucks. Uh, reducing churn at its core is a relatively simple problem, and that's just solve your company's, uh, solve your customer's problems. But just because it's simple doesn't mean that it's easy. If you've ever played golf or basketball, the premise is easy, but it's very difficult. So uh, that is also a caveat that there aren't going to be earth shattering ideas here necessarily, uh, but I will be providing the framework. And at a high level, it's really just you know understanding what your customers' problems and goals are, positioning your product to address that narrow problem, and then delivering value 
to solve their problems. And so that's the, uh, the reason why I have this image here is ultimately you are a bridge between your problem, your customers now and the problem that they're experiencing and then the better version of themselves that they see once they use your product and derive the value from your product. So the other thing is that it is also a tangled mess. Uh, despite being simple, and every every churn challenge is its own snowflake with unique needs. Um, it's it's a thorny problem for everybody. So a couple things here: there is no single solution like, hey, you can do this, and then all your churn problems are gone. Um, but instead, it's actually just a, a series of initiatives and what you're looking at. So, uh, survey chim, for example, ten percent churn, gross MRR churn. But there are a lot of factors that play into that. And so that's really what I mean by layering in initiatives to slowly chip away at that churn. Uh, like I mentioned before, it's a team effort. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a debate really who owns churn. It could be uh, many people in an organization. But in order to really make monumental changes in it, it requires a team effort. So that's super important uh, to get the whole team, uh, as in the whole company, aligned behind these churn efforts. Uh, another point here, there's often imperfect or incomplete data. Um, we'll get into this you know, in several of the phases that I'm talking about, but uh, if you're familiar with uh, you know, digital marketing, running split tests, you're, you're kind of working with imperfect data or incomplete data, but you need to go with that data set, make your best assumptions, uh, hypotheses, and then test on that. The data that you you get back from the tests will be uh, important in reducing churn, but to get there, you kind of need to have this leap of faith with the data that you have at your fingertips. And then lastly, it takes time and it, it takes testing. Um, so, you know, it's not necessarily as simple as like, a lead gen or paid media where you can kind of like turn it on and off, but it's it's an incremental improvement over time, uh, and that's also what what makes it so fun as a challenge to to figure out. So at first I was thinking I'd break this up into time buckets, you know, uh, three months, but I think it just makes more sense to break it out into phases as every company has uh, their own backlog of things to do and priorities. So. I wanted to break it up into three phases. Um, the first phase is really like learning, gathering the data. So that's speaking with the customers, running your analyses, you know, cohort analyses and product engagement. Then from that, you create your hypotheses. That's who, who has certain problems? Which of your uh, customer bases, personas have certain problems? What are the KPIs that, KPI that will impact churn? And then setting up the fundamentals. The fundamentals, I'll get it get into a little bit later. And then phase three is taking all that, all the data that you've gathered, your hypotheses, your segments, and then putting it together to run specific tests to uh, improve the metrics that you think are most correlated or causative of customer churn. So, you know, not surprisingly, uh, building a scalable retention strategy is very similar to building a scalable co the conversion rate optimization program in that the the um, the earlier steps are something that you're testing for, and then the outcome, whether it's acquiring a customer or retaining a customer, come from um, come from that. All right. So phase one. At the outset, I like to take a beginner's mind. So even if it's a product that you've lived or breathed or created from scratch. I think that it helps to take an arm's length perspective and see things with a fresh set of eyes as difficult as that might be. So that's kind of sometimes the advantage that I have uh, with Retainable coming in as an outside person uh, because I'm not, I haven't been mired in the product and I don't have deep seated assumptions of what customers are and, and how they interact with the product. So the ultimate goal in this, this whole thing is uh, and particularly in phase one, is to get a deep understanding of the customer journey from end to end. So that's really uh, who is signing up. So from there, you're creating different segments of um, users. So for example, in SurveyChimp, it might be uh, a consulting company or a legal firm, uh, but we want to understand 
who who's signing up, what their use cases are, what problems they're trying to solve, and then why do they leave? So the root cause of churn, I believe, is often based in a misalignment of what the customer's expectations are and then what happens when they're in the app, what the actual customer experience is. So if we're able to understand what the different customer personas are and how the product can address those, I think it's a huge, hugely important foundation to build upon um, and improve your retention over time. So that's what we'll tackle in this first phase is really learning about the customer, the company, the reasons for churn. All right, so the first step that I like to do if I'm going in and if it were SurveyChimp, for example, is learn from customers, speak with the customers, uh, and I like to seg segment them out based on various outliers of time, money, and usage. So uh, I like to cherry pick some of these customers, um, and you can look at your CRM or, or your email, email database to pull out customers who fit this, Chart Mogul as well is very helpful in segmenting this, but uh, there, there are ultimately four segments here. Uh, the high LTV customer, so this is a person who, uh, or a customer who pays a lot of money, may be still active, might not be, but it's really interesting to understand what they're willing to spend so much money for, what value are they deriving. So to segment for this, you might look for you know uh, the top quartile or so in of LTV in your SaaS metrics tool like ChartMogul. Um, another is the highly active feature user at the top. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that they are also a high LTV customer, but they're just really using the product a lot. And so this is something that you can get from your product engagement tool, you know, say Mixpanel or Pendo, but identifying what those key features are and those people who are constantly using it both in depth of every session and also in frequency of sessions. Uh, next, I like to speak with the recently churned customers. So, you know, the, the customers who canceled their subscription in the last 30, 60, 90 days, who, who still have a fresh memory of what their experience was with the app and then why they ultimately decided to churn out. Um, a, another way to segment this is, you know, different LTVs, lifetime values. Again, you can pull this from Chart Mogul or your, your SaaS metrics app. Uh, and lastly are the disengaged customers who are still paying, but not really using it that much. Why are they not using it? Uh, where was the gap or where was the, the change in expectation from when they signed up to um, when they kind of like started to disengage? I think that there's, there's a lot of value to get from these four segments. Uh, ultimately, each conversation, whether it's a phone conversation, which I think is best, it is time consuming, um, would consist of what's the initial reason for sign up? What did you find valuable about the product or what did you think was valuable? What is valuable with your actual customer experience? What could be done better with this product or the experience or the onboarding? And then lastly, for those who did churn, why did you churn? So these conversations and the feedback you get if you're not able to do actual phone conversations are hugely valuable in providing a more detailed and nuanced view for understanding why customers churn. And also a, a nice added benefit of speaking with the customers is that those conversations, the exact verbiage and, and the pain points and the benefits that they are bringing up can be repackaged, repurposed into product marketing or into support docs or into the onboarding to help people get to the key milestone moments. But to sum up, there's a lot to be learned from speaking with the customers. And so that's really the first step I think um, that, that I always take and that I do recommend. So even if it's something that you, you know, it's your product, you've been in there a lot, try and take the beginner's mind and um, take that approach. All right, so the next step is to close the feedback loop. One of the things I think that is super challenging as a customer grace, customer base grows is staying close to customers. Uh, the support team, of course, is always at the front lines with customers, and they're sitting on a tre treasure trove of quantitative and qualitative data. But I think that is also really important 
to systemize the feedback loop so that there's a constant line of communication and feedback from customers. So this could include uh, what we have here, you know, in-app surveys, NPS surveys, emails, questionnaires, uh, one-off emails, chat, support tickets. There are there are numerous uh, touch points, data uh, touch points with customers that are really helpful. So if I'm going in, you know, not everybody has the, their finger on the pulse of the customer sentiment like the support team. So getting a, a deep understanding of that, whether it's you know an outsider or you're going in and digging digging into your own company's data, I think it's it's hugely valuable. So the goal here is to what I call close the feedback loop um, because it can be easy to kind of like send out email automations or campaigns, but there's no real impetus for them to uh, share feedback back to you. So just creating an automated system is really important because that can also raise red flags for customers who are dissatisfied. They might raise their hand implicitly and say, hey, I'm not super happy here. Uh, I would not recommend this to a colleague. That's an opportunity to reach out and learn more. So that's another way that you can hook in your automated feeds, you know, whether it's you're using Wootrick or whatever, um, you know, create a, a Zap, a Zapier API hook to your support tickets or your, your email automation, drop them in. But um, trying to create a closed loop of communication between you, your product, and the customer, I think is really important uh, in proactively reducing churn. All right, the next step that I like to take is reviewing the existing reasons for churn. Um, there's a lot of addressable opportunities here, and I think understanding the nature of customer churn uh, is where you can pull out some of these opportunities. So like I said in the first phase, we're trying to understand the whole customer life cycle and why customers sign up, what, what value they derive from the product, and ultimately why they churn out. So if your comp company has been collecting this data, fantastic. It's a great opportunity to go through and then you can kind of see where where are there outliers in terms of a large proportion of customers showing dissatisfaction and churning due to one particular reason. Um, I have an example here. I think ClickFunnels does a great job. Uh, they have a, a multiple choice of reasons to churn. And then from there, well, we, we'll get into it later. Um, it's, it's a little bit of an offboarding flow to address those challenges, but it doesn't need to be anything complex, you know, like an uh, in-app experience. Uh, something as simple as an email could work. Here's an example from Yes Insights uh, sent from their team. Uh, why did you churn? And it's just uh, reasons. So I, I don't know this email. I got this um, pulled this from their own website, but. I would imagine that those are hyperlinks to a landing page that would address those particular objections. And if you are similar to what ClickFunnels does, you can address those objections with a reason. So um, here is an example of what ClickFunnels does in their offboarding flow. In this particular example, it's for somebody that found that it was too expensive. So. ClickFunnels is making a very concerted effort to prevent churn by addressing those objections of, um, of the product being too expensive, which is just code for not getting enough value from it. Uh, so you can see here there's a video from their CEO founder, Russell Brunson, speaking directly to why it is actually like not expensive or what the val reiterating what the value is, but then also offering a few options to downgrade. So not the, the best option because it is reducing recurring revenue, but at least it's maintaining a customer relationship um, as opposed to a, a churn customer or offering alternatives like uh, helping them become an affiliate marketer or um, education in weekly Q&A webinars. Um, regardless, this is a really good way to capture the reasons for churn and then ultimately try and reduce churn and, and get people reactivated, re-engaged here by um, realizing that they're, they're missing something in the product experience. Uh, I should mention here that there are 
third party software tools, you know, Brightback, Less Churn, Bear Metrics does this um, to kind of create a an offboarding flow where you'd have different incentives or, or reasons to help hook people back in. But um, I think that this is a, a really uh, cornerstone fundamental part of a retention strategy that you should implement if it's not already in existence. So uh, this is an example uh, that I do as well because I, I don't always have access to a, a third party app or not all companies do have uh, third party tools like right back so you can just basically export the reasons for churn I love to read through it I think that there's a lot of meaty substance in there and then ultimately you're categorizing what those reasons for churn are uh, I like to create columns for each reason you know if price is going to be one features uh, leaving for a competitor those are all going to be run ones um, and then just kind of marking them and then tallying them up and then that's kind of how you how I came up with the uh, pie chart at the right. Uh, one other important thing to layer on is that there are, it helps to quantify in terms of monetary value, whether that's what the average revenue per user is, the ARPU, um, or at a high level, maybe the lifetime value. Uh, it, it is important as well if you can to uh, inject the, the monetary element of reasons for churn here. So I love uh, cohort analyses, and I think that it is a, a really helpful way to identify um, the, the nuances of churn, to diagnose churn, um, especially when you look at different segments over time. So uh, the the SaaS metrics tools that you use, um, whether it's you know charge be profit well, uh, bear metrics, uh, but I really like chart mogul to um, to segment. And, and look at the cohort over time. So what we're looking at here, just to explain it briefly, is reading across the rows are the month or the week. Generally for a B2B SaaS company, it'd be the, the week, I'm sorry, the month for B2C or, or mobile apps, it would certainly be a shorter time frame. But for the B2B SaaS app, it's uh, months going across and then the numbers zero, one, two, three, are their months in the customer life cycle. Um, but uh, they're, they're really helpful because it allows you to isolate particular points in the customer life cycle and identify if there have been any changes or improvements in a particular month. So um, for example, for SurveyChimp, we said that it's 10% gross MRR churn. So that is not super helpful because we don't understand where those customers are churning in terms of what month in their customer life cycle, nor do we really know what the the more nuanced details are. You know, what what plan type is churning out, what geography, what um, a, any type of demographic or use case or um, self-identified persona is. So those are the things that you can pull out from a cohort analysis. Um, you can then use those takeaways to focus the efforts on uh, where churn is highest and see if you can create any improvements to carry forward in future cohorts. So we'll get into that in a little bit with onboarding, but I think a cohort analysis is really a wonderful place to identify where there are little opportunities in terms of the customer life cycle or type of segment to target to improve retention. So here's some, you know, like maybe basic blocking and tackling, addressing customers who churn but can possibly be saved. So uh, one is delinquent churn. Uh, ProfitWell states that it's 20 to 40% of all churn and from the companies that I've worked with and seen, that's kind of uh, definitely fits the range of companies, but that's a, a significant amount of revenue. So tools like ProfitWell or Churnbuster or Bear Metrics all have really great um, dunning, dunning management tools, um, Stripe as well. So you can just make sure that those are implemented so you're not letting money go out the back door unnecessarily. Um, another area of opportunity are what I call canceled but didn't churn. So customers have canceled 
but generally they do have uh, the until the remainder of their next billing date in order to uh, they have until their next billing date to use the product that is an opportunity that's a gap of time that they're still they've already paid for and they're still technically customers but they're on their way out and if there are reasons that they give in their exit or onboarding survey offboarding survey that are addressable that's absolutely a time to reach out you know if for example they're saying that it's a feature or if it's a competitor or if it's price those are all reasons that you can address you know you, you give them a discount if uh, you've decided that a discount is something that makes sense financially for the company or if it's you know a feature that they don't know about or haven't used uh, there's a, there's a lot that they can um, they can learn or that your support team can reach out to and try and get them back uh, because in many cases it might have to do with just customer education and onboarding and lastly uh, unsatisfied customers based on surveys questionnaires and support tickets so this is if a customer expresses that they're not happy in any of their uh, channels of communication uh, that's a little bit of a red flag that is a red flag of potential churn so that's something that you want to make sure of again try and create some automation if it's a woo trick NPS survey for example and it becomes a detractor you you want that immediately whether it's a slack bot or an email to your uh, support desk um, you want to flag that to prevent churn all right so onboarding uh, I think that onboarding is a critical part of the product-led movement so I think that there are going to be some fantastic sessions on onboarding I won't cover it too much but it is so important in this whole notion of creating a scalable retention strategy um, so I, I do want to spend some time discussing it um, this is a an image from adjust.com um, the the phases of new user, new user retention um, with onboarding and value discovery and basically if the the onboarding phase is the critical moment for getting a user hooked in, getting them to their you know moment of first value or their aha moment, so that they actually get that visceral understanding of what the product is about and the value that it can deliver. Uh, if there is any misstep or the onboarding doesn't necessarily come to fruition or completion, that that really does increase the likelihood of a customer who just does not quite understand the product which is why the, the drop from um, of retention in that onboarding phase is so precipitous down. So the primary objective of onboarding is to understand what problem your users are trying to solve and present the most relevant product features at the most opportune time. So uh, this is really ultimately premised on a thoughtful messaging and timing we are delivering helpful information to customers when they need it to increase the likelihood of their success. So what I what I say here is like, what is the retention funnel? What are those key milestones that every user needs to have in your product in order to achieve their notion of success? So you know, SurveyChimp, for example, I would say that the key actions derive from creating questions in the survey. Uh, distributing the survey and then logging and seeing the answers and then pulling the analysis from it. So using that as a high level assumption, I would investigate the lifetime value and the churn rates for different users and use cases and take a look at users who did or did not uh, complete certain uh, of those milestones and then what the correlation is of completion of milestones to uh, short-term and long-term retention is there a correlation between these actions and an improved retention rate so uh, at a high level the onboarding is super critical and uh, I, I mentioned it last but it it's kind of bringing it full circle to understanding how to uh, deliver the most value to new users when they're most excited and have just signed up for the product so in order to present the most tailored and customized experience to users, it's important to understand how those customers 
define success. So here are a couple examples. Um, one is from SurveyMonkey. Again, like I said, I think a survey tool is a really interesting example because it's such a, a wide breadth of potential users. So SurveyMonkey does a really nice job of, uh, of that onboarding flow. What are the job, uh, you can see here, what are the job roles that you have and what are the job titles? So basically, what are the types of uh, use cases that you would have for signing up for SurveyMonkey? And then from there, they kind of feed you into uh, whether it's a pre-made template or uh, suggested questions. It just shortens the gap of trying to figure out what the product is by presenting uh, the most relevant content. Um, and it, it doesn't necessarily need to be in product like SurveyMonkey did. Groove does a really nice job. Uh, this I think is actually a fairly famous email at this point, but uh, from the CEO founder sending out an email, uh, what are you looking for? Why did you sign up? What are your main goals? Um, what are you trying to accomplish? So however you do get it, whether it's in app, a survey, um, an onboarding form, it's super important at, as a starting point to understand how your customers define success because that ultimately becomes the end zone, the final goal that you're driving them towards in the onboarding and then just in the general product engagement flow. All right, so now in this second phase, we wanna build upon the information gathering that we did in phase one to formulate the hypotheses on how we'd understand and address a customer needs more effectively. So in doing this, I find it most helpful to pull out one or two of the larger revenue opportunities in terms of customer segments. So that's a customer segment that can be discreetly defined, uh, whether it's you know by plan type or LTV or um, referral source. There are any number of ways, but what are those segments? What are the key metrics that you're optimizing for in order to get them to do more of? And then what are the messages, what's the content, and what are the challenge, uh, channels that you are going to leverage in order to impact those metrics on those segments? So that's really the, the crux of this phase two goal, which is to create the hypotheses of the information that, that was gathered in phase one to, to test out uh, going forward. So again, if we apply the example to SurveyChimp, we could select one particular job role here with a job level and a plan type. So for example, it would be logical to create segments based on the different job roles uh, in the onboarding phase. And then take a look at how does retention differ based on the different job roles? And to even go more granular, does a particular job level, you know, let's say it's a CEO or a VP of customer success, uh, do they have differing retention rates? Um, so at this stage, it's about identifying the different customer segments and then separating them out um, so that you can understand any explicit behaviors, differences in behaviors, and then how you can encourage those users to engage with certain features. Uh, this is all going towards uh, understanding what the customer's notion of success is, which we got in the last, um, in the earlier onboarding phase, and then how you can position your product and communicate and deliver uh, relevant information to fulfill that promise that you presented. All right. And then in phase three, this is really all about testing. So uh, package up all of the, the information that gathered in phase one, the segments and the KPIs in phase two, and then create a testing roadmap. We prioritize it thoughtfully based on revenue, op revenue opportunity, potential impact, and then you're just constantly executing, analyzing, and repeating. So it's very similar to what you might do if you're running a split testing program for marketing campaigns or a A-B testing or CRO. Uh, a lot of this is coming in my mind from um, testing from a, a marketing perspective. All 
All right, so this is an example testing roadmap uh, that I did. Uh, it's basically putting all of the initiatives on paper. Uh, like I said, it, it's very similar to what a split testing or, or, or marketing testing roadmap might, might look like, or even a product roadmap. I'll show you more detail. Obviously, this is a little bit too small to read, but I just want to show at a high level uh, what we have here. Ultimately, I think it's just most important to uh, to create the hypotheses of how you would impact different segments to do more of these key uh, key behaviors that you think would help them engage more and improve their retention over time. So this is kind of like the, the text version of what I have uh, what I had in the previous slide. But basically the, the first column, is a, at a high level is including all of the tasks. And I, I like to group these by uh, whatever is proactively improving retention. Reactivation, which is for customers who understand the product and the perceived benefit, uh, but have churned out. They're still a, a wonderful opportunity and I think that they need to be segmented out as opposed to just dropped in the bucket of all other leads. Um, upsell opportunities, so that's for existing paying customers to uh, to move up a plan or cross-sell if there are various uh, products within your portfolio. Uh, then delinquent churn, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that is an opportunity to that you do not want to forego in terms of letting failed transactions drain your uh, recurring revenue and drive your churn up. And lastly, uh, in terms of buckets, is tightening the feedback loop. It's, it is really important to make sure that all, uh, all gaps in communication are closed so that you're constantly getting a feed of customers and their, their feedback, not just relying on what social media might say or what people on social media might say or inbound support tickets. Uh, and then going across, uh, status is generally just the status of the test, uh, channel self-explanatory how you're going to reach out to them. The success metric, the segmentation and the sample size I think are where it is really important in terms of how you're going to prioritize what these initiatives are. And what I didn't include here but I think also might be uh, relevant and you might want to include in your own testing roadmap is uh, what's called you know the the pie or ice framework for testing it's basically what is the potential impact of running one of these initiatives uh, what is the difficulty and what is the confidence level that it will make a change that will make a positive change so ultimately this encapsulates everything that we've observed from the customer interviews, the quantitative analysis, and understanding where there are any gaps in the onboarding or the product, or really any point in the customer experience that can lead to unsatisfied customers and ultimately turning customers. So I didn't include other slides previously, but I, I do want to mention because they are really important as they relate to churn and retention, uh, pricing strategy, uh, Pricing is a huge and, and difficult, challenging topic in itself, but something that should be mentioned and, and looked at. Uh, customer support. So uh, support is, is, like I said, the front lines of customer communication uh, between or communication between your company and your customers. But you really want to make sure that uh, you are tracking things like uh, time to first response and the general customer satisfaction uh, with the tickets and making sure that their challenges are resolved. And then just what the competitive alternatives and the competitive landscape is. Um, the SaaS landscape is getting more competitive as uh, maybe the, the cost to launch and the barriers to entry are lowering. So it's always important to understand where your, where your weak spots are and maybe where there are alternatives on the market that are siphoning off your existing customers. So I just wanted to include these as areas to consider or investigate. So wrapping up here, I just want to bring it full circle and reiterate that at its core, improving retention is really just like starting a company again. It's finding a group of people who have an explicit problem that you can understand and 
creating a solution to their problem and delivering it in a way that no one else on the market can. So, uh, like I was saying, the, the, the challenge is, or the problem is relatively simple to conceptualize, but the challenge is that there are so many different moving parts and it's a multifaceted problem. Uh, but most importantly, I think also, is that it is a team effort. So it's an organization-wide effort, uh, and a lot of companies, I think, do espouse that they are customer-centric and that's part of their core values and the way that they communicate as a team. Uh, but it's really great to make this make retention something that's front and center in the company in terms of the transparency of the KPIs that are shared um, and how it's communicated and then a general dashboard uh, for all of these important metrics uh, to help the com your cu customers succeed. So anyway, I hope that this presentation was helpful in at least providing some ideas to help identify how you can create a better customer experience from the moment of sign up all the way through to the moment of cancellation, and then how you can ultimately help your customers get more from your product.